Welcome to Resiliency Web Chats, conversations with individuals in the UMD community about moments in their lives that required resilience. Together, we learn about the strategies they use to be strong, stay strong, and move forward in challenging times. I'm Dr. Lisa Irwin, and I'm so excited today to be talking with Karen Strummy. So welcome, Karen. Thanks, Dr. Irwin. I love it. I love being able to see you and talk with you always. So uh, of course, um, those of you who know Karen know just what an amazing leader she is uh, at UMD and in the Duluth community. She has been recognized for her amazing work by the NCAA, by her colleagues in the field, and she uh, is really um, a tremendous asset to us and a tremendous colleague at the university. Uh, she has a successful UMD coaching career and time as an athletic administrator. I'm sure we'll touch on some of those things today. She is a champion for women in just the best sense of the word, and, and I admire her so much for that. I, I want you to know she's been a key partner for us in student life, and she cares about the students so deeply. She's been a tremendous advocate for students. She's worked with us on preventing sexual misconduct, and she has been uh, really at the front of the line and, and doing amazing work around student mental health, which are really important issues to us these days. So again, Karen, we're really honored to have you. Uh, I'm going to start with with just having you tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey at UMD, how'd you come here? Uh, what kinds of jobs have you had? What's that experience been like? Well, so th this is a loaded question, but I'm, I'm, I'm reeling back and this is what makes you probably really nervous is like, how long is she gonna go back? But I really have to kind of begin by saying that I grew up, um, we came to Duluth because my dad was a AAA manager for the Detroit Tigers. And so he was, he moved in and in our first house, we moved in two doors down from Malosky's, which is Jim Malosky, which is the football coach of 40 years that our stadium is named after. So I, I grew up in the backyard of UMD. I went to every game. I got kicked out of the halls by the policemen because we'd be playing in here and all these different things. And I, I sit here today going, I just can't imagine having a conversation with my 12 year old self that I've been working at the same institution for 40 years. <laughs> so this is my 40th year at UMD. And um, I think when I then fast forward again, um, a little bit more to seventh grade and the, and the reason why sports has meant so much in my life is I was six feet tall in seventh grade. I was the tallest person in the school. I was um, including my teachers <laughs> and everything. And it was, you know, of course, like everybody, all you want to do is be like everyone else. And I wasn't. And I was miserable. I'll be honest with you. I was, and you talk about resilience. And I was like, I used to go to bed and pray at night. Would you please just take a foot off my legs? I'm just don't want to be this tall. And then we had seventh grade, it was Title IX. I was the birth of Title IX. And the first thing we did was had a seventh grade basketball team. I didn't know what I was doing, but I could hold the ball above my head and nobody else could touch it. And I was good as a result of that. And then we had a swim team. And when I dove across the pool, I touched it before anybody else. Could. I was, you know, that person. And so I really do think I was reborn at that time to have confidence and resilience. And I had people that would, um, you know, the coaches and other things that said you could do it. And I think that was the beginning of it. And that made me forever realize the importance of having role models and people in your life that can, um, you know, just really encourage you and tell you to do it. So that's my start of my path. And I went away to college graduated in 1982 and I came back and all I could think of was I'm not, I had a couple job offers, they weren't great, but I wanted to live in Duluth. That Lake Superior has always called my name and I love the city, I love everything about Duluth. And I, in 1982 with a jobless rate of about 14%, I came back and said, okay, what in the world am I gonna do? So I took a job selling shoes at JCPenney's. <laughs> and it was a competitive job. You got commission, of course, for uh, you know, if how many shoes you would sell. And, and and the reason why I'm telling this story is is for you know for you to hear is that I think I could have been like crabby and not done a good job because I would have felt like I was I was above that. I it wasn't good enough for me. But I think it's just a lesson that I learned again is no matter what you are doing, if you do a good job, no matter what, someone will notice and they'll say, hey, you know, Karen, I she she's she does everything, that, you know, or something like this. And I just it was just, again, a resiliency about I was miserable that I wasn't in a career and I went to four years of college and whatever else. 
But then one magical night, Linda Larson, who was the head coach at the time, came and wanted to look for a pair of shoes. And I, of course, sold her about 10. <laughs> no, but what she did was ask me, would you be willing to be my assistant coach? And I said, oh my gosh, yeah. And then it began. So from 1982, um, I was the assistant coach. And then this is a story that you probably don't even know, is that first year, Ralph Romano died at a UMD oh. hockey game. And yeah, that was my first year as an assistant coach. And when Bruce McLeod took over, he asked Linda to become his full-time assistant as a woman. She therefore could not be a coach any longer. And at age 23, I became a head coach at UMD athletics. I mean, how about that? Isn't that's that amazing. crazy? Yeah, and that's so amazing. Since, I know. I mean, it's just like crazy. And you think about all that. And so my journey began here as a coach at age 23, when many of my players were the same age as me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I looked at all those things and, and then you fast forward and I used to be the new kid on the block and, you know, the young Karen, whatever. And now I am the most senior, except for Gary, my husband, um, person in, in the athletic department. So I've just kind of gone through the whole generational thing and, and traveled. And then I've also made the, um, the, um, switch, I guess, is when, when, um, we had the opportunity to have a full-time position when Linda retired, I had to decide, okay, I loved coaching. I never thought about ever leaving coaching, but I was, you know, I was probably 50 at the time and thinking, can I do this 15 more years? Can I possibly get off the bus at four in the morning and, you know, all these other things. And so I applied for the job and I got it. And I'll, I think then too, to be honest with you, Lisa, the first, couple years that I was in as an administrator from a coach, I was miserable again. Mm -hmm. I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And I just thought again, I think those things in the past when you just realize what do you do, um, you know, to really find your way is just realize that things get better by doing the things you've always done, working hard, caring about other people doing, you know, getting involved in your community, you know, all those other things. And then now I think I've been, I think this is my 15th or 16th year as an administrator. And I'm like, that's, that's where I am right now. So I, I get up in the morning and I feel blessed and I love most things about my job, like all of us, but that's my story. So there you go. <laughs> it's just a great story. I think the, the um, leaving what you know and going to what is unfamiliar is always a challenge. And it sounds like, uh, well, we're really, really lucky that you, that you applied and made that choice because I think you've, it's a place where you're able to make a difference in a different way in Lisa, your you administrative maybe, job. You made me think of one of my favorite phrases to tell people about going out of their comfort zones because we grew up by Chester Bowl and there was a ski jump. And when ski jumpers jump, they actually lean forward enough that they don't see the tips of their skis. They just see the sky and there's no ground. You don't see anything that's underneath you. And so I always say getting out over my skis, but you do at some point know you have skis on, right? So you go out of your comfort zone a little bit, but that has, I think that's defined me. And I think it, you're right. You, you said it so well, it really defines a lot of people. Take risks that are calculated risks that push you a little bit to go beyond what you what you were before. And the results can be really amazing and, and yeah. life-changing, not only for you, but for the people around you, Yeah, which is yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, as a coach's kid and as someone who's just loved sports all of her life, I think the, the resilience application is so, so apt. Yeah. Uh, sports is about facing challenges. It's about looking down at a really difficult challenge and thinking how in the world can we beat that team? How in the world can I get better? So as you think about sports and, and your involvement as a coach and, and as an athlete, um, where, where, are, where are the challenges for, for you and how did you face them? Well, you know, I think you brought it up just about sports and resilience. And one of the things I hear from employers all the time that call us and say, do you have any student athletes that you that would be willing to work for us? I think what they did, what they do, Lisa, is they learn through failures, right? And that, you know, you lose games, you lose the race, you don't get to play all the time, you have setbacks. But I think what athletics does in a really way that is so safe and it's a lot of times because you have people that are there to help you and guide you and just say, hey, let's take a look at and honestly look at what we're not doing well. 
<laughs> and how many of us really do that, right? How many of us, we, we usually put the brakes on and have an excuse. Oh, well, uh, you know, but athletics doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the better team or whatever. Every single time you step on the floor, you have to bring it or someone will beat you. And I think it's a great way to not take yourself too seriously, if you will, mm. and realize that it's what you do, not who you are always in your performance. And that it, it, it really has given a, a way to look at yourself that give yourself a break and move on and get better. And, you know, all those other things. So I think that that's my favorite part about coaching. And I used to say to our players a lot, because I know before they really could be okay with all the criticism, because as coaches, you're giving a lot of correction, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. It's really that they know you care about them. And how do you do that? You know, it's building all those relationships. But I used to say, will you get better? Or will you get bitter? Oh. And I, I, I used to, I, and I say that to myself a lot now, you know, when I work, so I, I, I love working with Josh Burlow right now. And I think we've really gotten to the point over the years that we've really trust each other. And we really, you know, in closed rooms, we can say, honestly, <laughs> you know, tell each other the real, what we really think. And I, I have really worked on that even more because he's, he's honest but he's caring and, and he's made me get better. And so I appreciate that too. I appreciate having a great coach like Josh. And also, I know, I know you don't want to hear this, Lisa, but you are just such an incredible role model for me and what you do. And you, you really are. So I just want you to know that publicly. I want to say that to you too. You're amazing. Well, that's, that's really appreciated. <laughs> you are. Um, thank you. You know, um, I think when I think about coaching, and maybe even in your current role, I think the pressure is different in athletics because your win loss record is out there for everyone to see. My win loss record in my role as an administrator is a little bit more concealed or or private or not as obvious. Maybe maybe that's the best way. We're not concealing anything, but it's just not as obvious. So do, do you find that, that 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 is true in a coaching role or an administrator role that the pressure around athletics can create that need to be resilient? Well, I, I don't know who said this. We steal all of our, you know, who is probably started in the Bible, but from whom much is given, much is expected, right? Ah, so right. I, I really think about that. And we talk to our student athletes a lot about this is that, um, you know, we are given this profound opportunity to go and compete for, for athletics and all these other things. But with that comes a grave responsibility that everyone is watching. And how lucky is that? Yeah. that we, I sometimes walk in the store and somebody says, hi, coach. And I'm like, who, you know, who are you talking to? And, and I think that there's things that, and we would say that to our student athletes, that if you think for a minute that people don't know you when you're talking to somebody in a grocery store or downtown or wherever you are, that you need to be, you know, a role model at all times. And so I think I have heard sometimes like with let's, let's use wearing masks, Lisa, right? Yes. And sometimes COVID. we'd say, you know, it's easy to tell if there's a football player that's, you know, six, five, 250, 270, whatever, walking through and his mask is down. Hey, a football, we saw that your student athletes aren't wearing their masks. Well, there, there are other people not wearing their masks too, but we have to do it right all the time. And we need to, and we should, because we, people are looking up to us and the expectations and all those other things. So that's one part of the story. The other part of the story that we talk about all the time, and, and I remember this as a coach, is that I think our student athletes and coaches put more pressure on themselves on a daily basis about mm -hmm. succeeding mm -hmm. and thinking that we are defined by our wins and losses. And even though we are, <laughs> We really aren't because there's so much more to the story of what we do and who we are than wins and losses. But that is a profound part of it. And I used to say when we'd have our, um, you know, we get together and we put our hands in the middle, we'd go winners. And winners didn't mean winning only. Winning was the result of being hard workers and, you know, having a team attitude and working, you know, together and, you know, all those things. That was the result of the other goals. Winning wasn't our goal, if that makes sense. Makes and I perfect think sense. the lessons that coaches teach them every single solitary day, it's, it would be fun for everybody to watch practice and then go, oh, 
this is why they're, mm-hmm. they play so much better than somebody else. Mm-hmm. So that's what I loved about coaching. And that's what I love about athletics. That's what I love about our coaches and our student athletes is that they are working on much more than their skills. They're working on resilience. They're yeah. working on believing in themselves. They're working on as a freshman, when you were the best best, best player that ever was. And you come in and you're surrounded and others are better than you. How do you keep your confidence? What do you do? You know, I mean, it's all those things that in that journey. And again, I circle back to how blessed we are to have incredibly talented and caring and compassionate coaches. You know, listening to you talk about the pressure in that way, I'm really reminded of what feels like a crisis in student mental health. And so those are linked. Are they not this idea that I'm not, you know, all the pressure that one puts on themselves can result then in, in a student being less well overall, not just mental health, but physical. And all of those things are certainly linked and connected. So I love that our coaches have that in the front of their brain that student mental health is, is, a, is a conversation in your department among your student athletes. And um, I want to note for posterity that the department and the student athletes just won a national award for their green bandana mental health project. So it's really important um, what you're, to recognize the, the things that way and then to know how to support them. You know, let's talk about your student athletes for a moment because one thing you and I share is just this profound commitment to our students and a real love for being around them. It's really obvious just watching you among them and how much they, um, they really care about you is also very evident. But COVID has certainly been, and you're in my, you know, you and I are more at the, toward the end of our careers than we are at the beginning, for sure. And I think it's, we would both agree, it's just not like anything we have ever been through in our many years, um, 40 40 years in the field. Um, But I would love to to talk in a positive way about what you've observed about resilience in your student athletes, you know, where are, do you have a story or two about, or just some examples of where you've seen resilience in your students and you've really been heartened by that? Yeah, you know, first of all, I think Lisa, you really touched on for all of us is that it's just really acknowledging every time that you can, that it's really hard. I mean, you know what, you think about our lives in January, in, you know, darkness and cold and COVID and you know, all the things that we're struggling, it's hard. I thought about it the other day. I thought, "Hmm." you know, I was just like, oh, this is so hard. And then you think about your life. And then I thought about five things that I'm grateful for, because that's what I do to make myself smile again, you know, like, oh, you know, and maybe those, those younger people don't have those resources and tools, and they really don't the same that I do because of life experiences and everything else. But I do know that one of this whole movement of the green bandana is really end the stigma of talking about about mental health and that mental health is health and that you know you hear all these words but it's just we had a time where our student athletes came in and talked to our coaches about how they should talk to their to them about mental health and it's just like great you know idea. what you know yeah it's like hey you know what it's okay to ask, but if you ask and I say I'm struggling and I have anxiety, check in with me again and realize that it doesn't have anything to do with how I perform on the floor. And you know what the coaches said too? They echoed that back to them and said, we want to know everything that we can do to make you a better person and, and to succeed in life and to be a better player. And if that means that we have to, you know, whatever we can do, we want to be on your path and we want to be with you. And it was really like those breakthroughs because two years ago when we started or three years ago with the mental health task force, student athletes didn't want coaches to know under any circumstance that they were struggling with Mm -hmm. mental health because they figured that's that coaches were going to judge those things or bench them. Right. Right. And so I'm going to just tell you the story of Becca Osborne, who is the person that really has has led through all of the thick or thin. We were chuckling today because two years ago she was sitting in the gym trying to sell Chuck a basketballs, you know, by herself to get this to buy green bandanas to hand out, you know, I mean, it was by herself and then slowly and all these different things. Well, Becca tells the story to our student athletes and others about what her life's, I mean, her struggles with um, PTSD. And she was very, very 
open and honest and talking about her journey. And the more she told stories and the more she's opportunities, it's like the Pied Piper. And I'm not trying to be belittling it. It was like all of a sudden this momentum started building and she had the idea that mental health, health awareness, if the, we keep, we, we've got work to do, right? So every single solitary one of our teams has a mental health, health awareness game. And when they sell t-shirts at that game, it pays for the next team's t-shirts to wear, you know, and so it's been kind of a, you know, pay it forward kind of thing. And then during that week of their mental health game, a counselor comes and talks to their team about mental health. And so it has really been such, so welcomed. And I see our student athletes with those green bandanas and those health, those, you know, and the stigma t-shirts and what Becca has done is she has now when she speaks, I like, who are you, Becca? You have just turned into this amazing spokesperson. And she has now been invited to be on the national green bandana staff. That's She's been wonderful. Hired. Yeah. They, I mean, it's, they said that, that this is one of the strongest programs in the nation. And I want to credit her. I mean, there was a lot of other people that walked beside her, but the story of resilience, where it was trauma, that she walked through the path and gathered more to, and then she thought she's going to pay it forward. That was her resilience. I think it's awesome. It's just it awesome. Is. Right. Yeah. And the strength right. that comes through. Um, she's, she's become a stronger person. And oh, that's she's amazing. Huge. Yeah. And she yeah. wants to work now. She's applying to grad school. She wants to work, you know, for, with student athletes and mental health. I mean, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It really is. it's really cool. So, and I love, I think, you know, your story also for me demonstrates the partnership we have with a counselor coming in. I mean, our partnership at a school, our size, it's absolutely critical. And so we're really lucky to to have those resources that we share with one another. Well, when I've sat on your um, sexual violence prevention task force, Lisa, that's what we've talked about forever and you've instilled that and it's teamwork. Karen, let me recap a little bit of what I heard today and see, see how this um, tests us with you to see. I, I would say in the early part of your life, resilience for you meant doing a good job no matter what. And if things got tough, do the things you know work, work hard, um, get involved. Uh, be present. I, I love that. I, you just, it feels to me like you learned early that being present mm -hmm. helps you take the, the focus off of worrying and build, build your resistance. Right. Um, and then in sort of the middle part of your career, I was hearing lean over your skis, you know, get out of your comfort zone, but know that your right. skis are there and you're going to land. Mm -hmm. The importance of having folks around you that help you land, mm -hmm. build your resilience and learning through the mistakes that you make, which is um, sort of a lens toward mistakes that builds resilience rather than focusing on what you did wrong that sort of detracts from it. Um, I love not taking yourself so seriously. You know, are you going to get better? Are you going to get bitter? That's that's something we could put on our all walls, on all of our office, especially through COVID. But I, I really want to end with um, something that is really growing in terms of uh, steam, and that's gratitude. Mm. I love that you said that gratitude is a is a component of your resilience because I, there's more and more being written about gratitude as as um, a component of mindfulness and happiness. So thank you for for ending there. I think that was really wise. I just want to tell one last story because I know I just can't because it was a long time ago a coach that came here, and um, she said that her one of the things she used to do is like if a student athlete got hurt, they, she played the 30 second game and she said, okay, you have 30 seconds. Um, tell me all the reasons why this could be good. And it was like, oh, well, I guess I could, when I'm sitting on the bench, I can learn more about what is, I could, I could give the teammates around me that I haven't been able to, you know, by the end of the time after 30 seconds, they felt better. Right. And I really think that the, the, the essence of it for me about gratitude is you know, I was walking and I had to go do something today, you know, to go down and get labs, you know, for whatever. And I was like, I, I was just so crabby at first. And then I went, boy, I'm lucky I'm still here that I can go get labs and that I can, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden, yeah. honest to God, Lisa, I felt better. And I'm yeah. like, it is, it is something that it's genuine for me because it's just reminds me to look where to look at a different way. Now, everybody can't do that. Sometimes life is really tough and it's really yeah. hard and you can't be looking for what you're grateful for, but 
on a daily basis I do and it's really it it brings a lot of a, it brings a lot of resilience it really does it does as a strategy it certainly can be challenging mm -hmm. to, to try to find the gratitude you're right and, and I think yeah. some days it's harder than others it's but hard, it's, yeah. it's, it's sort hard. of a tried and true though as as a as a way to feel better it's pretty tried and true yeah I agree, I agree. any I any other parting thoughts you'd like to leave us with today as we think about you know, I, I, I guess the last thing is that just, and I won't go into this, but I just see, because I heard um, our student athletes talk about that, tell their stories, tell their stories because you'll inspire others. Um, I, yesterday I had the year anniversary. I had a full on heart attack. I had open heart surgery and I'm a survivor. And so, I mean, what I can say about that is that, that my health prior to this was like a badge of honor. Like I didn't take anything mm. but vitamin D. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and all the, I know I have these pill cases and everything else. And my, my cardiac surgeon, who is just so amazing. She said, Karen, she goes, get up, br brush your teeth, um, wash your face, take your pills and get over it. And what she meant was <laughs> control the things you can, right? Yes. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I got to take some pills now, but I want to tell people that, you know, changing your attitude about this. And I would tell my story to further another time about women's health and other things, but I'm really, really grateful to be a survivor. Yeah. <laughs> and I oh. practice it and I think about it. And I, I mean, Lisa, the best thing that I can say to you is I still remember when you sent me magazines and it was like, I didn't have the energy after surgery to read a book, but I love those magazines and you know, and I'll never forget that. And then you learn yeah. so many things from so many people. So that's my yeah. last thing is just to say, maybe you share a story that, you know, maybe people don't know everything about you and to give right. others a break and to, before you know, the whole story is just like, we're all going through tough times, aren't we? And that just give each other kindness and, you know, just look for the best in all of us. That's what we should keep doing. It's hard because it's a hard time, but that's what I would say. So that's really, and I'm sort of excited and honored to be on a one-year anniversary doing this. It seems especially fitting. And I'll never forget the first text we exchanged when, you know, I gave it a minute before you, yeah. after the yeah. surgery, but what a relief yeah. to have you text me back. And and so we so are so grateful too. to be celebrating that with you today. Me too. Me too. So thank you so much, Karen. Great. It's been an honor today. What a fun day. It's always when I get to talk to you. So. Oh, thanks. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.